Nowadays, we are spoiled for choices when it comes to the gear that we can choose to take underwater with us to capture amazing photos and outstanding video. On today's show, we're going to talk about some of the different options available to you as a diver and what would work best for you. Welcome to Everything Scuba. <laughs> Hey guys, what is happening? Welcome back to Everything Scuba. I am Lyle, and if you're a first time viewer of our channel, welcome, we're glad you're here. We are here talking about, well, everything related to the world of the sport that we love. And if you love it too, if you love to scuba dive, dive into Everything Scuba, hit that subscribe button down below, ring the notification bell so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. So in the previous episode with me, we introduced you to the new backdrop here at Everything Scuba with all the photographs, the Jacques Cousteau quote. But we also talked a little bit more in detail about how we captured each of these images. Uh, we captured them with different equipment, we captured them with different techniques, different lighting methods. And so if you're like me when you first started underwater photography, and if you're interested in getting into that part of scuba diving, it is really confusing because there are so many different pieces of equipment, different types of cameras, different ways that we can capture those images. And so what our goal is within this series is to demystify some of that for you and try to help you choose what might work best both for your diving style and your budget. So one by one we're going to walk through these different things that are in front of me. First up is the good old iPhone or Android device. Uh, yes, we can take our phones underwater with us these days. Uh, no, we can't take calls while we're down there. Uh, the whole point of scuba diving is to get away from that kind of stuff. But uh, some of the camera systems on our phones these days are pretty amazing. Apple will tell you that this is water resistant down to 6 meters or 18 feet. Would I take my nice iPhone underwater with me? Not in a case. Absolutely not. And so there's a couple of different options available these days when it comes to iPhones or Android devices. Sea uh, Life just produced a, a product called the Sport Diver, uh, where it is iPhone specific. Uh, it's a, a case that you can use for that iPhone. And uh, a company say called uh, Diveroid, my wife actually uses a, a Diveroid device. Uh, her iPhone goes into that device, uh, it gets sealed up and it actually can Bluetooth with the phone and there's a small mini computer on the front of that so she can actually see some of her dive information and uh, becomes like a backup dive computer for her also. So iPhone, an option. Next up is the action camera category. Uh, many of you are very familiar with GoPros, uh, great cameras. This is uh, actually a DJI Osmo Action. Uh, I bought this uh, close to a couple years ago now, and I've really enjoyed using the Osmo Action in conjunction with some of my underwater uh, camera systems. What are some of the pros to this uh, action camera? Well, uh, when it comes to uh, the DJI Osmo specifically, it has a back touch screen uh, where obviously it, you can use that as your viewfinder. On the front of this though, it has an extra tiny little screen. So if you're underwater, maybe shooting some uh, selfie stuff and you want to make sure that you're in the image or you know whatever it is you're trying to capture, you can actually see that in front of you. Um, you can use this for still, for, still photography up to 12 megapixel uh, uh, images. Uh, obviously most people are going to shoot video with it. With video, it shoots 4K at 60 frames per second. Uh, it slows itself all the way down to 240 frames per second, I think in 720p. So you can get that silky smooth uh, slow motion underwater action should you want to. Uh, this is rated uh, water resistant down to 30 feet or 10 meters. And uh, generally I'm going to dive with it in its own little case. And uh, this case is specifically made for the Osmo Action. Obviously, once I put it in the case, I don't have access to the touch screen anymore, so it changes a little bit of your capabilities there. Uh, but this case is rated down to 180 feet or uh, 60 meters, which as recreational divers, we're never going to get to. Easy to travel with, easy to get in and out of the water instead of carrying, you know, 20 pounds of gear. Uh, this basically clips off to me and away I go. The biggest downside with me is obviously there's no interchangeable lens. 
the field of view is what it is. It's about 140 degrees and you're stuck with that field of view. So this is the DC2000 made by Sea Life. Uh, my buddy Josh, the co-host here on Everything Scuba, he actually dives with the Olympus TG6, another com compact camera, but also just a, a phenomenal product. So uh, some of the pluses to the, the system. Um, this is a camera that will capture a 20 megapixel image, uh, both in RAW and JPEG formats, uh, if you want. Uh, from a video perspective, there's no 4K capability on this camera, which has never really slowed me down, though. I've still uh, been really amazed by some of the imaging that can, I can get from it. It'll shoot in 1080p, full high definition, uh, down to 60 frames per second. So if I want to really slow down that motion, um, I get great slow-mo capabilities from the camera as well. Um, this is... Uh, a camera that is very easy to learn on because the, it has four dive settings. So uh, if you're snorkeling at the surface, if you're diving without any kind of external uh, lighting, uh, either be a strobe or a video light, um, or if you're diving with a strobe or a video light, those four settings are just simple pre-programmed settings within the camera. The camera can make uh, adjustments to uh, white balancing and exposure settings uh, to allow you to use that equipment without really knowing all the details in relation to how to expose it properly. However, once you get that down and if you want to really start to learn more about how to manage the image completely, you can set this into a fully manual function. So you're choosing the ISO, uh, you're choosing your f-stop, you're choosing your shutter speed. Um, and you know, really taking full control of the uh, image itself. It's rated down to uh, 60 feet without a housing, uh, 20 meters without a housing. Uh, I've never really used it without the housing because the, the housing uh, gives you a bunch of other advantages other than just depth. So this is the, uh, the DC2000 uh, housing and this is rated down to 200 feet or six, uh, 60 meters. Uh, as recreational divers, we're not going to get to that uh, kind of depth, obviously. Um, it's a basic hinge uh, opening. There's a, an O-ring that we want to care for on the inside. And it's just a latch system to pull it closed. There's no vacuum system uh, inside of here. And we're going to get into vacuum systems within housings to talk about why that's maybe a good thing. Uh, but I, I've never had this leak on me. I've never had any, uh, any problems. Um, the other advantages to this is there are a variety of wet lenses that you can attach to the front side um, of this uh, housing. On the underside here uh, we have a, a quarter inch opening that allows us to uh, put it on a handle system and uh, we can attach flexible arms which now allows us to attach strobes and video lights uh, and we can really turn this little camera into a full rig that uh, will, you know, again, really give you the ability to take some amazing photos. And uh, like I said, if, if you guys want, uh, uh, I've been using this for a number of years. I'm pretty familiar with the Sea Life system. Uh, if you'd like to have more information on that, drop us some comments down below. Be happy to make a, a video looking at uh, the Sea Life uh, DC2000. Next, let's take a look at mirrorless versus digital SLR cameras, so single lens reflex cameras. So uh, first of all, the um, most obvious difference between the two is in terms of size, both width and physical size. This is a much more compact camera, almost the size of the DC2000. Obviously, it doesn't have a lens attached right now. Um, the difference between these two is so a digital single lens reflex actually has, and I'm not sure if I can show you this that well, inside here you're looking at a mirror that bounces the image up and there's another mirror that bounces the image through the viewfinder so I can look through the viewfinder. Um, the classic sound that you hear when you activate the shutter uh, is that mirror being lifted out of the way to expose the sensor to allow the image to be taken. A mirrorless camera, as the name suggests, does not 
have a mirror sitting in front of the sensor. Um, the, the, the image hits it directly and then you're viewing it on the viewfinder in the back. Now, comparison wise also with these two cameras is when we're looking at sensor size. So typically we've got a full size sensor inside a, an SLR camera versus this has a four thirds size sensor, so not as large. Uh, what we will tell you is in SLR cameras, um, these sensors are going to give you obviously a, a higher resolution picture. Uh, they do better at low light environments. There's maybe less noise, less grain. Uh, that's why these are definitely the choice of professionals when they are uh, taking those things um, into account. Um, However, we also have to take into account all of the other things that go along with these cameras. So the other nice thing about both mirrorless and SLR is the ability to attach different lenses to the front side of that camera. Now that's not to be said that we can't use wet lenses. This right here is a wide angle wet lens designed for this camera system. Uh, but it does give you the flexibility to change from a true wide-angle fisheye down to uh, this, for example, is a 105 millimeter uh, macro lens, and uh, you know gives you a lot more capabilities in terms of the, the types of uh, photographs that you can take. Obviously, you then have to figure that into the port system that you put into uh, the housing. And so, like I said, when I first got into looking at advancing from a compact camera, these are the things that were very confusing to me because there's so many choices of different lenses and different cameras and the housing and how do we set that up. And so again, what we're trying to do is hopefully clear some of that confusion up for you if you're considering getting into this, uh, this world. Um, cost difference, that's really one of the big factors for me uh, when it came down to, I'm not a professional photographer, do I want to pay professional photographer prices? So uh, when we're looking at pricing of just the camera body alone, um, for example, I think the Canon EOS uh, Rebel, uh, that's about a $690, $700 camera just for the body. We're not buying anything else with it just for the body, whereas you can then step up into the world of uh, other DSLRs where you're paying maybe $6,000 plus for that DSLR. Um, then you're adding your lens costs and the housing. The housing itself can be a significant cost factor when it comes to uh, underwater photography. And again, for uh, the Canon EOS Rebel, for example, uh, you can look at backscatter and uh, there's about a $1,700 housing that will fit this. But again, we're going to need maybe some interchangeable ports and things that will add to that. And then again, you can step up into six, seven, eight thousand dollars plus for housings that will contain these cameras. Remember, these cameras are not like the Compact C Life DC2000 or the Olympus TG6. We just can't take them underwater unless they're inside a housing. Uh, and so that becomes an essential component to being able to take great photographs underwater. So for the rest of this series, we're gonna primarily concentrate on this camera because it's designed for this system. So this is the Olympus EPL-10. Um, when I bought it, it came with the kit lens, which is a 14 to 42 millimeter uh, lens. What does that mean to me in terms of what kind of things can I take pictures of? Well, um, underwater, uh, I can get down to almost the macro level, little damselfish. Uh, and I can, you know, if I'm far enough away, I can certainly get something that's uh, a decent size, maybe uh, the size of a tarpon or a barracuda. Now, if I want to take a, a picture of a whale shark or sharks in general, I might be looking more towards a, a wide angle lens, which we've got this attached to the system. And we're going to go through this in detail in the future. Uh, I also purchased the 60 millimeter uh, Olympus macro lens, which I can switch out. I can also switch out the ports on here. And so this really lets me get down to little tiny size, uh, things like uh, tiny shrimp, um, yellowhead jawfish. Um, but you even have options to add diopters 
further to the uh, housing. So now you can get down into the size of a, a grain of rice uh, to take really super macro shots. Um, the things that I like about this camera in terms of what it can do for me, there's uh, definitely a step beyond that of uh, the compact system. This can shoot in 4K at 30 frames per second. It shoots uh, 1080p at 120 frames per second. can shoot in RAW and various uh, uh, JPEG formats. It has some fancy um, imaging uh, software within the camera, which I really haven't used. I don't need to use for my purposes for underwater photography. It has in-body three-axis stabilization, which a lot of cameras use the lens to do the stabilization. The in-body stabilization has been awesome for both just getting nice still images and then also for videography uh, purposes as well. So, and cost became a factor. Uh, we talked about the DSLRs and how they're phenomenal cameras, but we're getting into uh, the professional level and professional level prices. So uh, the basic base cost for this camera is around $499. And by the time we start adding on all of the other uh, accessories and things that we, we need a housing to take this underwater with, uh, the cost starts to get up there. And so you, there's got to be this balance uh, if you're a photographer between uh, efficiency and quality and cost. And so for me, I figured out that nowadays, some of these mirrorless camera systems, actually some mirrorless cameras now have equivalent uh, sensor sizes to that of SLRs and do a phenomenal job uh, underwater. Also, unlike uh, the TG6 or the DC2000, this does not have simple dive modes where we can just dial it to that little fish on the uh, icon uh, on the back and away we go, we can take pictures in whatever format we want. Um, this does have some auto modes and different scenes and ways that you can easily take pictures underwater without having to know every single detail about how to expose that picture. But the ability to take full manual control, uh, white balance the camera, which again we're going to talk about in a future episode, and achieve really stunning quality, beautiful colors. Um, I've just been blown away. I've been very, very happy with this camera. So. Uh, so far. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to go into a lot more detail because we are going to get into the nitty-gritty and the guts of exactly what this camera can do as we review the entire system and then step into the different formats of wide angle, macro, and videography. Regardless of what type of camera you're going to use underwater, I've seen some divers with the world's cheapest camera system taking phenomenal pictures and video underwater. I've seen some of the, the most expensive camera systems with divers who take horrible pictures underwater. And what is the difference between those two people? We have to remember that we are scuba divers first. The photography comes second. And so on our next episode, we are going to talk about what are some of the tips, tricks, and techniques that you should know to be able to be a phenomenal underwater photographer. Click the link up above. Mm -hmm.